Awesome. Thanks, guys, for joining the webinar today. I do know that your lives are very busy, and to take 15 minutes out of your day to join is very appreciated. I know also the holiday time is one of the most busy and hectic times in your office with patients squeezing in those last minute appointments, maximizing their benefits. So uh, again, it's very appreciated. As the moderator said, my name is Brian Botman. I'm the Special Markets Manager for Implant Direct. Today, our topic is techniques to grow and sustain your practice, how simple changes can help make significant results. During my time in the dental field and before I got into my career in dentistry, working with owners of uh, businesses to grow and sustain their, their business has been a passion of mine. Uh, regardless of the medical or dental device I'm creating awareness about, my first goal was always to help their business grow. I always made sure I aligned myself with the companies and the products that truly fit that mold as well. So that's why this topic today on the dental practice is so important to me. As you listen, try to take away at least one pearl that will help make your biz the business aspect of your practice better. So much time is spent on the clinical aspect, as it should be, but very little is often spent on that business side. I hope you find this information insightful, and uh, thanks again for logging in. Just as a quick disclaimer, these opinions, views, and the discussion is the material of the presenter myself and not those of Implant Direct. Implant Direct does not endorse these statements. If you've ever had the privilege to visit San Francisco, you know it's one of the most unique and amazing cities we have in this country. The seven by seven mile melting pot of cultures, food, and experiences from all walks of life. But there is one specific part of San Francisco that stands out to me more than anything. It's the island of Alcatraz. When you're standing on the shore and looking at this little island that used to house the most dangerous criminals in the United States, it doesn't seem that far away. It looks a little frightening, but not really all that over the top. Now, with that image in mind, was this you when you first got into owning your own practice? Where you knew it was going to be a lot of work and a little frightening, but nothing you couldn't handle? But if you've ever had the opportunity to visit that little island is where the true fear and intimidation come in. Standing on Alcatraz or on the boat in front of it, you feel as though the land is somehow farther away than it was when you were on the shore. The fog that often looms over the city seems a little bit darker, the wind is stronger coming off the ocean, and you just kind of feel that intensity of Alcatraz. Now put yourself on this boat, standing on the edge, knowing the only way back to the city it's a swim. You're looking forward, as many of these athletes are, and you notice several elements that are going to make this journey extremely difficult. A current rushing five millions of gallons of water so fast west that if you just sat there for an hour, you'd get pushed past the Golden Gate Bridge. Water cold enough to make your limbs numb in five minutes. Unknown marine life swimming below you. Water so murky you can't see your hand in front of your face. Waves that could reach one to three minutes, washing you up and down. And to cap it off, fog that limits your ability to see the shore, even though you know you're swimming towards it. That's a lot of elements working against you trying to swim to shore. Is that how you feel kind of in your practice today, now that you're in it? Looking at a, like a lot of elements are working against you to keep you from growing and sustaining that practice? In my conversations with Dennis, they often feel like these athletes that are standing on the edge of the boat. The only difference is the types of elements that they're going to face. Elements in the dental field, such as competitive offices moving in on the same street corner, potentially, depending on where you are, the same building as you. Insurance companies lowering the reimbursement or patients losing and changing their benefits. Increased practice overhead. Trouble with your staff causing the office not to run as efficiently as you would like. The money put into external marketing doesn't seem to be bringing you the new patients you thought it was going to. There's a lot of elements that are working against you. Today, I'm going to discuss with you some insight on how we can help grow and sustain your practice in an ever-changing dental environment. The topics that we're going to run through today are going to be avenues for growing your practice, implant industry facts and figures, the market and the opportunity in the general practice, offering the optimal procedure mix, looking at different types of procedures that you do in your office, Insights on local fees, averaging the, or understanding the implant value proposition, case acceptance techniques, value of a strong internal patient referral network, 
and becoming more efficient through education. Before we dive into deep, let's take a high level look at different avenues really to, to help you guys grow your practice. First, and you know, kind of one of the most obvious ones is to raise your fees. The most obvious, but it's oftentimes the most overlooked option is to raise your fees two to three percent each year. This is simply just keeping up with the rate of inflation. Second is to increase new patient flow. Another common area people are consistently trying to reach for. If you're reaching for new patients via external marketing, really ensure your staff has that solid script to follow as you're receiving inquiry calls. This is an extremely important part of practice growth. External marketing can help generate phone calls, but the key is to convert these phone calls into new patient appointments. Third, ensure your team is on the same page every single day is critical to the well-run office, therefore having morning huddles. This is a step in working on your practice versus simply just working in your practice. Understanding what patients are coming in that day and if they have outstanding treatment plans. Knowing where the best place in the schedule to put emergency appointments, as well as is there any new patients that are coming in. Those are great things to be able to discuss in these morning meetings. They don't need to be long or more than five minutes but they do need to remain consistent so that way the team kind of understands and creates that efficiency for you guys. Fourth is increasing case, increase in case acceptance. It's one of the most effective ways to grow your practice. It doesn't happen without putting in a lot of effort, but increasing case acceptance by, by a mere 5% can really have major benefits on your office. I'll cover this a little bit more further down in the presentation. And then increasing procedures performed. As I was doing research uh, on office procedure mix, there were a couple benchmarks to look at. 90 procedures is around the average for a general office, and 110 to 120 is what's considered nowadays to be a super GP. To determine where you fall, all you have to do is run an ADA procedure code for a full 12 month time block, and that will give you where you're at on that range. Uh, of these, I'm going to be spending a large percentage of the time to discuss the benefits of adding and increasing your implants or, or your focus on dental implants and the effectiveness it has on your practice in both the case acceptance as well as the procedure mix. Before we dive into why dental implants are one of the best procedures for your practice, we need to understand the market and the opportunity that it does have for your practice. There are some high-level statistics provided by the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, as well as the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons about this opportunity. First, the AAOMS reports 69% of Americans 35 to 44 years old have lost at least one permanent tooth. The AAID reports that one in four Americans over the age of 74 have lost all of their permanent teeth. This represents 35 million Americans. The AAID also reports dental implants have a 98% success rate. This market for dental implants is a big pool, but it's also going to continue to grow. With a better understanding of the total implant market in the US, let's dive into the specific GP channel. In all the research I could find preparing for this webinar, I saw a stark contrast in the amount of GPs placing implants in the United States versus the amount of GPs placing in the rest of the world. In the US, a reported 37.3% of GPs are surgically placing implants, representing just one-third of the country. In the rest of the world, depending on the source, between 80 and 90% of GPs are placing implants. Why do we believe that the U.S. as a percentage has less placing general practitioners than the rest of the world? There could be a mul multitude of reasons, so I reached out to a lot of the doctors that I work with during my travels uh, to figure out why they're not placing implants. So here's a couple of the reasons that I received from them via phone calls, in-person uh, conversations, as well as email. I want you guys to see if any of these will resonate with you as I run through them. Placing implants, it's a difficult procedure. It creates high liability for me and my practice. Number two, patients prefer a bridge over an implant. 
Number three, just getting into implants costs a lot of money. Therefore, it would take a long time to become profitable with this procedure. Number four, I don't have the time to get the proper training. Getting, implant, getting trained to place implants takes a long time. And lastly, there are many implant systems. How do I know which one's best for me and my patient? You know, we all have our own unique concerns, and I don't want those to go unnoticed. But the truth is, there are one-third of GPs placing implants, and with a growing patient pool, coupled with strong research from reputable organizations backing the success rate of implants, this is an area you're going to want to invest in. With understanding how many GPs are placing implants, let's kind of look at how that compares to other specialty procedures that are out there. General practitioners increasing their procedure mix is something we have seen significant growth in since the 2008 recession. GPs have had to find other avenues to keep production up. The Levin Group did a study breaking down where some of these increases are. In 2014, this study shows that over 90% of general practitioners are restoring implants and doing cosmetic procedures such as veneers and full mouth reconstruction. These markets truly are saturated. You're competing with everybody. Then as you work your way down the chart, we begin to see the increase in specialty procedures. This is where you see the doctors who are performing that 110 procedures a year uh, are at. Endo being the highest performed specialty procedure, but one thing to really take note of, there's a near 20% decrease in providers who perform endo and those who perform it regularly. You can see that in the third and the fifth column. Second, we have orthodontics, which could be contributed to the increase in a lot of different orthodontic providers to the general practitioners, such as clear aligner treatments. But on the bottom of this list, you have at 37.3%, it's surgically placing implants. There's also a little notation I want you guys to kind of take a look at, is that that's report is saying that they only have placed one implant surgically, not a regular basis. So drawing, the, drawing from the number on those who perform endo and those who perform endo regularly dropping 20%, what percentage of GPs do you believe are placing implants on a regular basis? Again, this is another compelling reason and statistic point to how implants can help separate you from that competition. So now you're, you're sitting there, you're thinking, this is all well and good information, but I would, I would imagine there's not many patients in my practice or cases that would fit within my clinical scope I'm willing to treat. How does that look in my practice? Not all dental implant cases are suited for general practice office. Everyone has different clinical skills and abilities, so we need to look at what cases that produce the highest level of success and efficiency in your practice. Case selection is crucial, and we'll touch on that shortly, but let's dive into what cases truly are good for your general practice office. According to Dentistry Today, 80% of all implants placed are single units. If we couple this information with our previous statistic from the AAOMS, 69% of Americans, 35 to 44, have at least one missing tooth. This is a sweet spot for GPs to be placing. Single unit cases have a higher likelihood of being less complex than working with multiple units in a, de in a dedential space. If we break this percentage down a little further, 70% of all single unit restorations are for posterior teeth, and nearly one-third of these posterior teeth represent lower first molars. And, it, and I know I, even in my talking, that jumbles the numbers a lot, and it's kind of hard to understand. So let's break it down in a more digestible into your practice. There are 100 implant patients that are getting implants placed. 80 total implants are going to be single units. Of those 80 single units, 56 of these implants will be on the posterior teeth. And of those 56 implants, roughly 18 are going to be on the lower first molar. That represents a little bit over one implant a month. This is really a sweet spot for you guys to look at and begin increasing your implant placement. These cases are suited for really creating efficiencies in your office. And as we know, efficient work is more profitable to your dental office. When we start getting into more complex cases, this is where, as a clinician, we need to think, should I be doing this case, or do I need to be referring this to a specialist? 
In my previous position before coming to Implant Direct, I also worked in another specialty of dentistry. Much like implants, there was a need to understand what the GP could clinically do with their skill set and what cases needed to be referred to a specialist. I often found myself in the previous position and currently today consulted by general practitioners whether or not they should be treating specific cases. My response with my previous position and here is always, if you're questioning yourself now, I think it's best that you send this to the specialist. If you're looking to place implants or just looking to restore them, having a strong partner with a specialist is extremely important. Remember to put yourself in the patient's shoes as well. They will want all options presented to them on what clinically is best for their oral health. If placing an implant on him or her is out of your clinical comfort zone, always know you have a specialist to refer that patient to. Secondly, specialists are also aware of the increasing number of GPs learning to place implants. Some of them have strategically aligned themselves as a mentor to these individuals as well. This in turn has strengthened the relationship with the referral base and has increased the number of larger, more complex cases being referred back to them as specialists. This strong avenue for you to look at in developing not only your own clinical skills, but also doing what's best for the patient's final outcome. Again, creating efficiencies in your procedures will help you sustain the practice's profitability and flow. That's the key to GP success in implant dentistry. Now we kind of looked at the market that really can benefit the general practice office. Let's kind of dive into why implants and why adding or increasing them is one of the best ways to increase growth and create profit production sustainability. As a general practitioner, I've been in a lot of offices, I've done a lot of preceptorships. You guys have busy schedules and to stay on task and the potential of several different procedures in a daily mix. But do you know which one of those procedures is best for your business? I know in talking to a lot of dentists in dental school, you're taught so much of the clinical skills and the practice of dentistry, but you're not taught much or anything about running a business. And this is where I see a lot of dentists struggle with the understanding of which procedures truly are most profitable for their practice. In the next couple of slides, I have a simple formula for you to com compute how much each procedure is truly contributing to your practice. I encourage you, take this information, apply it to your own practice, because this is, this is generalities that we're working. If you need assistance with this, please reach out to your implant direct rep. They'll be sure you, to walk you through this same process. Understanding that the business side of your practice is one that I've found that is often overlooked and underappreciated. The harder you work sometimes doesn't translate to growing your practice. One of many key success one of many keys to a successful practice is understanding which procedures are bringing the most profit to your practice. In preparation for this webinar and throughout my career, I've talked to so many colleagues, consultants, dentists that that talk on this subject. A couple former colleagues of mine who now run Clear Edge Innovations wrote an article about the importance of profitability in a dental practice. It discusses the importance of profitability as a whole, the different stages of profitability in a practice's life cycle, and the need to continually make your office profitable. One of the, key, the, the important figures to really understand and kind of what helps you create a simple formula is total procedure fees minus your procedure variable cost divided by your total doctor procedure time. This equation will give you profit per chair time hour. It's a very easy number for you guys to work through to really see what procedures are producing your guys' most profit. Very often these numbers are different for each clinician based upon efficiencies with a specific procedure, fees, and negotiated variable cost. In another Levin Group study, it was observed that the minority of your procedures are what's producing the majority of your profit. Another way to look at that is the following. Between 20 and 30 percent of all procedures in your office are done on multiple teeth. These make up more than 55 percent of a dental office's profit. Understanding which procedures are helping your practice sustain and grow is key. I'll encourage you, you really take the time and learn this information about your practice. I'm, I'm constantly surprised at how many people do not take the time to understand this. 
I would also not be surprised that when you do do these e equations and figuring this out for your own practice, you'll find one thing to be consistent. Implants tend to be one of the leaders of the pack in terms of most profitable procedure for your office. So let's dive a little bit more into the numbers and see why. Today when we work through these, I'm going to be using the national fees average. We have a lot of people from all over the country. And I pulled these numbers from the source of the national average fees for dental procedures, 2006. It's their 34th volume uh, of this exact publication. The fees are based upon ADA procedure codes. And for every zip code in the country, there's a, a different percentage that you would multiply this national average by to give you the number that you need. So for example, like Beverly Hills, 90210 is multiplied by 1.109 of this national average fee, making it uh, more expensive than the national average. Whereas if you go, if you're in Oklahoma City, it's multiplied by 0.6866. That makes their average fee lower than the national average. As we can see above, I've highlighted what most practitioners would agree are the most profitable procedures in a dental, in a general practice office: crown, bridge endo and implants, which in implants in this particular situation, we're going to include the surgical placement and the final prosthesis. Let's apply the formula that we talked about from the previous slide to these procedures. This is the next step in looking into how much the average time is for each procedure as well as the variable cost. You know, kind of as a disclaimer, the variable cost and time per procedure will vary depending on the provider. So make sure you take the time to do this process with your personal fees. I, I asked again several uh, dentists that I work with just and kind of merged all the numbers together to come up with these averages. As we work through this process, you know, begin to think about your own procedure mix. What would that look like if I converted half of my bridges to implants? How much chair time would that save me uh, to have more comprehensive? exams with new patients. Is there an opportunity for me to leverage the volume of crowns I'm doing with my lab to help me reduce overhead? As you can see, based upon the potential revenue per hour, what is often thought of as the highest profit procedure is crown. is in fact actually the lowest profitable procedure based upon the averages that I gather from the data. Even if you're more efficient with the total crown procedure and do it in a total 45 minutes, you're roughly only around $1,300, which, which still has you below uh, bridges and implants. But let's take a look at what, you know, the two that are often compared the most, which is implant and bridges. First, uh, I want to make sure I mention that we need to take into account what's truly best for the patient. At the end of the day, we need to determine what is most beneficial for this patient's oral health and lifestyle. So when I give lectures, uh, live, and I don't have that opportunity to do it now, I always ask this, the group this question, is removing the cost barrier. As a patient, would you choose an implant or a bridge for an edentulous space? In all the lectures I have given, I do not have one person who has said they would prefer a bridge over an implant clinically. If people who have a higher dental IQ than the average patient would choose an implant over a bridge, do you think if your patients had the same information, they would choose an implant over a bridge? Taking this information into account, let's look at the potential revenue per procedure. As, as mentioned in the previous slide, clinical efficiency is a direct correlation to profitability. According to the national average fees, we can pretty much call them a wash as implants are only 80 more than the traditional option. The average time for completing a bridge from start to finish is around two hours versus the total average for a single unit is around one and a half. Again, as you become more efficient, these times can decrease on both procedures. This not only helps with increased profit per hour, but this also has the opportunity for you to free up 30 minutes of chair time by switching some of these bridges to implants. Imagine what you can do with an additional 30 minutes spread out across new patient exams on a regular basis. How do you feel this would impact that new patient experience by spending a little bit more time with the doctor? Do you feel it would build a better relationship with them, increasing the likelihood of referrals and case acceptance? 
kind of really taking a, a recap at the hard evidence that we have. Dental professionals prefer implants over bridges almost unanimously. Dental implants are nearly $500 more profitable per chair time hour than bridges. Dental implants, when clinically efficient, will reduce the amount of chair time needed, opening up more time for other procedures or processes in your office. Not only are there the direct benefits but they're to increasing implants, but there's also kind of the indirect benefits. So let's take a look at some of those. One of the biggest findings when I had talking to patients who either have both an implant or a bridge or have had one or the other is patient satisfaction. And a couple articles read on the different dental publications, patient satisfaction for dental implants is between 93 and 97 percent. Patient satisfaction is so important in asking for and receiving internal referrals. As we can all attest, we know internally referred patients are the best new patients a practice can have. Another added benefit is the increase in future case acceptance. If you've ever had a patient who's had a poor experience in a dental office, they're far more hesitant you know, to accept treatment. The contrary is also true. When you've provided a patient who is highly satisfied with your dental work, good treatment, they're far more willing to accept your treatment recommendations if diagnosis warrants it down the road. With all that information provided, is this a compelling reason to take the next steps into building your practice? Offering and recommending implants to your procedure makes it a surefire way to help increase production in your practice. So now that we kind of looked at some procedure mix, Let's kind of take a look at case acceptance. Who's ever been on Yelp and read reviews of your offices or other dental offices? Sometimes they're absolutely brutal and some of them are even comical. Let's take a look at this one. My entire experience was terrible. The office staff was horrible. I would recommend that you find another dental office. They initially tried to sell me a very expensive laser teeth cleaning which I declined. After they agreed to give me a regular cleaning, my teeth had chips. So if possible, I'd give them zero stars. Not only this patient feels though they're being sold to, but their entire experience was poor. Now let's read this next one. Went in for a cleanup, left without a head. Didn't even accept my insurance. Now, I really hope that that's nobody's practice is on here, but that's Again, it come, kind of comes back to that nature. The patient's experience was really not good, and that's one of the things that you got to really work. We got to work on for case acceptance. So, in order to take advantage of that additional revenue and production we previously discussed in the slides about the procedure mix, we need to ensure you guys have a system in place for case acceptance. What you're currently doing for what are you currently doing for your cases that are over three thousand dollars? Is it working? Is it not working? Are more patients coming back to your offices to start more comprehensive treatment plans, or are they walking out the back door? If they are, do you have? If they are accepting this, do you guys have this plan documented for when you guys bring on new staff? It's important to understand there's a difference between presenting a basic treatment plan, i.e., a filling, a deep cleaning, versus recommending an implant, multiple implants, or a comprehensive treatment plan. As we discuss case acceptance. Let's stay in the second part of that, the more comprehensive, expensive treatment plan. When we present this type of treatment, what are some of the things we hear from patients? We hear things like this. That sounds great, but I need to go home and talk to my spouse about that, that amount of money. This has got to be the number one response that we're getting from patients without accepting treatment. How about this comment? How long is this going to take? Is an implant, is getting an implant painful? You know, one of the three main reasons people don't accept treatment is because of time, pain, and money, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. This week I was traveling back from Arizona just from meetings with some groups that I work with out there, and on the flight home I was able to sit next to a gentleman uh, with many years of sales experience. The one unique thing that he said about his experience was this, he says, Brian, I've got 25 years of awareness experience. The reason I call it awareness experience is now people understand their needs more than ever. I just need to make them aware of their problems 
and the best solution to fit the needs to their problems. All I'm doing is making them more aware. If you were able to join the first webinar that Dr. Tuttle did, it was awesome. I highly recommend if you weren't able to, to go back. It was on socket preservation. But she, she discussed what she called her second secret weapon, which is photography. When showing patients their interval photos, you're giving them awareness of what, what is going on in their mouths. Patients rarely, if ever, have seen their mouths the way we as dental professionals see them. Utilization of photography is a great approach when looking at how we can separate ourselves from the pack. I've been with several dental offices, and just by simply adding full mouth pictures, they've seen a huge increase in case acceptance. Second, we have scripting for specific procedures or situations in a dental office. Scripting is key to success in case acceptance. It helps getting everyone on the same page for specific procedures. Consider creating a script and continuing to refine it. Refine it. This is a very important process and it's often overlooked in the dental practice. Next, you have understanding the barrier, which is the time, pain, money that I referred to on the first slide. The three main reasons people do not accept the treatment is because of those time, pain, and money. Which one of these three is the patient most concerned about? Oftentimes it isn't because they don't understand the treatment itself, but possibly because other aspects were not clear for them to move forward. Be sure in your initial conversations with your patient, you're understanding why they might be held up in treatment. It's important to understand this element in presenting treatment. You'll change the way that you guys present based upon whether they're worried about the amount of time they're in the chair, whether it's going to hurt, or the financial aspect of it. Lastly is the support material that Implant Direct can provide you. We have patient education pieces in the form of trifold brochures. We have flip, flip charts for treatment coordinator rooms. Uh, and we also have, have vendors to purchase implant models from. Although some of these seem extremely simple, it can go a long way in creating patient awareness. Case acceptance really is the most difficult part of dentistry, but it's also the most important. And, and I really want to emphasize that. If you're struggling to get case acceptance, this is probably one of the best areas to seek additional practice consulting. You can attend as much clinical CE as you want, but if you don't get enough patients accepting treatment, it wouldn't be worth the time or financial investment. So kind of let's, let's break this down into more scripting and practical applications. Put yourself in a new restaurant that you've never been to. You've never read any reviews on Yelp, and you're starving. Your waiter comes over to you and asks, do you have any questions about the menu? This is something we hear kind of on a regular basis. And a very typical response from us or a patron is, what do you recommend? When we ask this, simply we're simply inviting the server to tell us about the restaurant specials or what a lot of other patrons get. But think about you know, that question and phrasing a little bit differently. Essentially, we're going to ask the same thing, but we change the wording to solicit a more personal answer. How do you think the server would respond if we asked it this way? If you were hungry and eating here, what would you choose to eat? Don't you believe you get a more real answer from the server? Sometimes maybe you can get something that's not on the menu. But, you know, as we sit here and we compare things, restaurant and dental offices don't have a lot of a lot of similarities, but we can kind of take this same logic and apply it to your office. Kind of as I travel around in dental office and hearing treatment plan, plans being presented, I notice a wide gap in offices who have high treatment acceptance to offices who struggle with treatment acceptance. Oftentimes I'm hearing treatment plans being presented with this initial phrase, is I recommend you, and then goes into the treatment. This is the same thing they've heard their entire lives in a dental office. There's not an emotional tie or any kind of persuasion or ethical persuasion from this statement or recommendation. Now let's take a look at that same recommendation process and tweak the wording to give it a more personal and emotional feel. What if you were to change it like this? If you were a family member I'm treating, I would recommend and then go into the treatment. It's not saying you're going to give them a different recommendation than you would any other patient, but this gives a sense of comfort, understanding, and emotional tie of your recommendation. 
this small tweak in the phrasing can help you draw more of an emotional tie in partnership with that patient. As we dive deeper into treatment acceptance, let's kind of take talk about implants and bridges as we've done in the previous slides. As we uncovered in the AAID statistic on, a, on the size of single implant opportunity, we have a large patient pool in their 30s and 40s who have a lot of life left. Understanding the lifetime cost of each option is extremely important. As you can see from this graph, the average lifetime of a bridge is between 7 and 15 years. That's pretty much industry standard. Therefore, for placing a bridge on a 45-year-old patient, we can safely estimate that patient will be getting between two and three bridges in their lifetime, depending on their life expectancy. This brings the lifetime cost to roughly around 10000 This is not taking into account the increased potential of endo needed to be performed on adjacent teeth, which would also increase the total treatment fees. Now if we take a lifetime cost look at implants. Implants, when maintained properly, which is key, can be a lifetime solution for missing teeth. Therefore, we are looking at one potential lifetime cost for the patient for this edentulous space. This is an important aspect that we need to be able to articulate to the patient. Furbish to consider in scripting as we've talked about is, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, as we've discussed today about your missing tooth, we have two options that are roughly the same cost. You can do a traditional bridge. This is where we prepare the adjacent teeth to support a tooth filling this space. It will create three artificial crowns for the area. This option has proven successful for many years. A typical bridge will last between seven to ten years, and then it will need to be replaced to ensure there is no no decay developing. The other option, and what I would recommend a family member get, is an implant. This is where I place an artificial root in the, in the missing space, allow it to heal for a couple months, and then place a permanent tooth on top of the artificial root. The main reason I would recommend this over a bridge is the following. When maintained properly, this solution is more likely to last you a lifetime. Also, we're not adjusting the adjacent teeth to fill this missing space, therefore you're keeping your natural teeth. This allows, and then lastly, this option acts most like a normal tooth. Does this kind of scripting look like a good solution for treatment presentation? Notice how we're not speaking negative about the bridge, but we're speaking truthfully about both options and highlighting the benefits. It's important we do not tear down one of the options because at the end of the day, we really need to make sure that this patient gets a, uh, fills this edentulous space. This is a simple exercise in scripting that you cannot just apply to implants, but really apply to all aspects of your practice. Kind of as we touched on with patient satisfaction, we're going to talk about uh, new patients in your office. The best types of new patients to have in your practice are those that are referred to you by existing patients. Not only are these patients coming because the, they most likely do not have a dental home, but they're coming to your office already having a positive notion from their family or friends. Looking at what you can do to increase internal referrals is key. Here are a couple options for you guys to consider when working with internal referrals. First, and extremely obvious but overlooked is ask. Simply ask for them. It's amazing how much simply asking for new patients can help. There's, an ob there's obviously a fine line between over-asking and planting a seed. But kind of one of the simple rules of thumb to help establish this practice in your office is to have staff follow up every compliment of your practice by asking for a referral. Scripting can be as simple as Mr. and Mrs. Jones, thank you, for your thank you for your compliments on our practice. We love treating patients like yourself. If you have any friends or family looking for a dental home, we would love to treat them, and we'll treat them with the same care we treat you. A simple statement like this can go a long way. Second, make sure you do high patient satisfaction treatment. When patients are happy or people compliment them on their teeth, it's often followed up with, telling their friends and family about who their dentists are. You know, kind of think about the procedures patients don't like, root canals, fillings. What about a lower removable denture? You know, I, in all my travels, I don't think I've ever found one patient who likes their uh, removable lower denture. 
But what about those procedures that have high satisfaction, you know, certain orthodontic procedures, but also implants? You know, as we stated earlier, between 93 and 97 percent patient satisfaction comes from implant patients. Also, patients who have had both would strongly recommend an implant over a bridge. These are happy patients who will continue to refer friends and family. But the reverse is also true, and also why it's important to make sure we understand our clinical comfort zone in maintaining that uh, strong relationship with the specialist. Again, these are just two of many ways to help increase internal referrals. So now that we kind of established a compelling reason for bringing on or increasing dental implants, let's kind of talk about how we get that going. The key to clinical growth, and I think we all would agree with this, is education. A direct correlation to clinical education is, effic is efficiency. And efficiency is increased profitability. If you do not educate yourself through coursework and then apply what you've learned, you're never going to feel comfortable placing implants. You know, one of my favorite quotes is by the former CEO of GE, Jack Welsh, and he said this, an organization's ability to learn and to translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. In, in my years in dentistry, the amount of CE junkies who truly never apply what they've learned is staggering. As you attend courses and when you attend some implant direct courses, make sure you create an action plan and apply what you've learned. Implant Direct supplies you with not only world-class CE in our education headquarters in Las Vegas, but we offer regional events as well around the country. As you can see, these are sample courses that we offer. We just recently released the 2007 edu education schedule that we can, can be found on our website. There's also a host of regionalized education courses and topics, so make sure you connect with your local representative to help you. Also going along the education is finding a GP mentor within your dental study club or joining an implant dental study club. You know, another thing is doing over, shoulder, over the shoulder days. Ask some questions. Develop this relationship. You know, it's a great way to apply what you've learned in CE to the practical application. You know, here, here's one of the, the great testimonials that, from our education courses. Uh, it's by Clay Hansen from uh, Utah. He said, in almost every implant direct course I've attended, I've come home with things that I feel I can apply on Monday. And I understand why I want to and why it helps my patients. I attended my first implant direct course in the beginning of June, and already my production has gone up by several thousand a month because of the increased confidence as well as the increased expertise I've gained from these courses. This weekend's course will certainly have the results in the well-being of my patients. I feel confident treatment planning and scheduling complex restorative cases now, cases that I've been re referring out for years. This is really kind of the this, this first step in bringing more efficient implants into your practice. Again, reach out to your local representative and they'll be able to walk you through that. So kind of as we wrap things up, we went over a lot of different aspects of growing your practice as we're coming in on that 15-minute mark. Uh, but the key takeaways are, are the following. When done efficiently, dental implants are a great production booster uh, and can potentially be the greatest production booster to a general practice. Understanding there are different levels of complexity, you've got to ensure you still refer out the cases that are too complicated for your dental office. Build a script for your team to aid case acceptance. Remember to always present both options to patients, both the traditional and the implants, with the clinical benefits of both. Implant patients are more satisfied than traditional bridge patients. Therefore, this will help increase internal referrals. And then Implant Direct couples a full range of education courses and simplified products to guide you through this journey. So as we talked, you know, the journey of a dental practice can bring you various elements that you aren't expecting, just kind of like that swim from Alcatraz to the city. But don't let fear hold you back. You know, dive in, just like these athletes. Take the leap to learn about your practice. Learn about the production in detail. Understand the business aspect of your practice more than you do now. Develop a script and then track case acceptance and watch it go up. Make adjustments continuously improve because when you do and you reflect, 
would be much like this so-called prisoner smiling, seeing how your practice grew and sustained. So, you know, one of the areas just to touch again on is the education, uh, implantdirect.com backslash courses, courses, or you can reach out to Lisa Lane. And secondly, uh, we do offer a get started package for you guys if you are looking to get started into implants or make a transition. Uh, this is a great value for you guys to have this, and we can send this as a follow-up to all the attendees uh, as well. So again, thank you for your time. Uh, if you guys have questions, I know they're going to be sending them over to me in the chat box. If you have questions directly to me that you don't want to be addressed on the webinar, feel free to shoot me an email. That's my uh, email for you guys to reach out. So um, see when some of them come through. The last one more question that we have is what role does insurance play in the average fees for determining profitability? Uh, insurances do add kind of another level of complexity to this equation. Uh, what you do have to do in that situation is kind of figure out what the average collections reimbursement is for each procedure. Uh, if it is a cash patient or an insurance patient, it's important to find where your median price is so that way you're doing your uh, calculations correctly. It will take time to find all that information, but what it allows you to do is help you really understand your business. I, I've done that with several offices, and it's been fun to help them understand kind of where their practice is, is gaining the most profitability from. Cool. With that being said, I know we hit the 50-minute mark. I want to be conscious of your guys' time. So again, thank you guys for joining. Uh, and the recorded version will be sent out. Again, there's my email. And if you guys want to reach out, feel free. Thanks again, and have a great evening.